Okay. All right. So Marie gave me the go ahead. So I'm going to do just that. Um, so I hope that you all, at least for a second, um, turn on the gallery view so you can see um, what a huge crowd we have this morning. Thank you all so much for tuning in today. Um, and I want to welcome you to the data release for Essential Equity, Women, COVID-19, and Rebuilding Connecticut. I'm Dr. Jenny Stedman, Executive Director of the Aurora Women and Girls Foundation. And I'm just thrilled to see so many of you here today. Um, the tremendous audience gives me hope. I'm inspired by the community members, legislators, corporate leaders, philanthropists, and members of the press who have joined us this morning to shine a light on the experience of women and girls during the pandemic. You might be feeling overwhelmed by the scope of the impact of the COVID-19 crisis. I think we're all feeling that way. You may want some clarity about how to do the best for the most of our fellow citizens as we work toward relief and recovery, which is why we wanted to talk to you about how centering women and girls will lead to the best policy outcomes and the fastest recovery for all of Connecticut. First, I wanna offer a brief overview of today's event. I'll start with a summary of the report um, and the collaborative effort behind it. Then we'll move to the methodology and sources of the report. And then we'll hear from three women with insight and experience related to key areas of the report. And finally, you'll hear a call to action. We'll leave plenty of time for your questions, which you can post in the chat as we go. What was the motivation behind essential equity? As advocates for women and girls, we knew that systems of sexism and racism already disadvantaged women and girls. And we braced ourselves for how the COVID-19 economic and health crisis would further harm them. This report documents that harm. Essential equity shows the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on women, and particularly on women of color, across areas of health, economic security, childcare, housing, and mental health. Oh, and safety and hunger. There are a lot of topics. So this is what we found Connecticut women are facing. Women are contracting COVID-19 and dying from it at higher rates than men. 54% of COVID cases were women. Black and Hispanic populations have higher case and death rates than white populations. Again, that idea of equity and the virus hitting women of color harder. Women are struggling to feed themselves and their families. There was a 300% increase in applications for the Food Assistance Program, SNAP. And finally, women aren't safe in their homes. The Safe Connect domestic violence hotline saw a 30% increase in calls. What the report also highlights is that effective economic recovery will not be possible without strong participation from women. 49% of Connecticut's workforce is female, and 48% of those are essential workers. For the first time in Connecticut's history, unemployment claims by women outpaced those by men, and that has held true throughout the pandemic. We have measured the negative impact of COVID-19 so that we can begin to address it with significant investments in caregiving, healthcare, housing, education, and job training, to provide relief and recovery that meets the need. Without childcare and paths to careers with family sustaining wages, women will not have economic security and the larger Connecticut economy will not improve. Today's presentation will focus on key findings in the areas of the eviction crisis, women as workers and caregivers, and the childcare crisis. We couldn't present all the report's insights. It's 47 pages but we welcome the opportunity to follow up during the question and answer session and one-on-one. -on -one. My fabulous colleague, Marie McNamara, will put my email in the chat if you'd like to contact me. Essential equity is the result of an amazing collaborative effort by women's funds across the state, women and girls serving organizations, state agencies, and many others. 
This report was made possible by funding from women's funds across Connecticut, and they were the Aurora Women and Girls Foundation, the Community Fund for Women and Girls of the Community Foundation for Greater New Haven, the Fund for Women and Girls of Fairfield County's Community Foundation, the Northwest Connecticut Community Foundation in honor of its Women and Girls Fund, the Women and Girls Funds of the Community Foundation of Eastern Connecticut. Community partners joined us in developing recommendations and refining the report. Those included, but were not limited to, the Connecticut Collective for Women and Girls, the Connecticut Women's Education and Legal Fund, or QUILP, the Sari A. Rosenbaum Fund for Women and Girls of the Middlesex County Community Foundation, the Women and Girls Fund of the Main Street Community Foundation, the Village for Children and Families, Health Equity Solutions, End Hunger Connecticut, Connecticut Coalition Against Domestic Violence, Connecticut Fair Housing Center, and Connecticut Early Childhood Alliance. And finally, I was honored to chair the report advisory committee that shaped the areas and focus of the report and met tirelessly to plan this event as well as the report. Thank you to Sharon Capetta, Trisha Hyacinth, Julia Scharnberg, Thayer Talbot, Lauren Parda, Carla Fortunato, Kara Strawn, Michelle reardon nold and Maddie Granado. Thank you to Marie McNamara and Carmen Burgos for their technical support this morning. And finally, this report would not exist without the outstanding efforts of the Connecticut Data Collaborative. The CT Data team of Elizabeth Grimm, Jason Chung, and Michelle reardon nold collected the data and analyzed it, all in the middle of a pandemic. I am pleased to introduce CT Data's Executive Director, Michelle reardon nold to talk about essential equities methodology and sources. Thank you, Jenny. Um, I also want to e echo Jenny's thanks to my staff members, Elizabeth Grimm and Jason Trung for their tremendous effort in pulling this report together in a short time frame. We were very happy to be involved in helping to put this report together and illuminate through data what many women have been experiencing throughout the pandemic. It provides important and timely insights on the impact of the ongoing crisis and gives policymakers and decision makers a comprehensive view on the situation as we prepare for the months ahead. Our focus was to look at real-time publicly available data that was disaggregated by gender and race and ethnicity. As many of you know, in some cases, data were not available in a disaggregated format or couldn't be provided in a timely manner. But we did include areas we hope to pursue in future research when data are available, which you'd find at the end of the report. We also looked at national methodologies to estimate the impact in Connecticut. For example, the increase in homelessness was based on methodology developed by Columbia University and the estimate of lost wages for women having to leave the workforce because of childcare is based on a methodology put forth by the Center for American Progress. And more details can be found in the appendices. Next slide. Thank you to our nonprofit providers and state agencies who provided data to us. This is not a comprehensive list, but does include the majority of the sources of data in the report. We are fortunate that new data was made public to help with the response to the crisis. Department of Labor provided weekly initial and continued claims data disaggregated by gender, race, and ethnicity, and also provided crosstabs of the data to us. Another new source is the Household Poll Survey, which is a weekly survey that began last April. The Census Bureau, in collaboration with five other federal statistical agencies, created this data product to provide real-time information to help states respond to the pandemic. So now that I've covered the more mundane pieces of the report, uh, we are fortunate to have subject matter experts in our program today to provide comment on the various areas in the report impacting women. The report includes an astonishing estimate of up to 1.2 billion costs to the state related to homelessness due to the pandemic. To comment on the disproportionate share of this that will be borne by women, particularly women of color. I'd like to introduce Alexis Smith, 
Executive Director of New Haven Legal Assistance Association, who with her team has been devoting significant resources to address the looming crisis. Welcome to Alexis. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate the introduction and the opportunity to talk to you about uh, such an important um, issue. Um, so I hope everyone is, is safe and well and remains well uh, on the call and thanks for being here. Um, so to give you a little bit of a background, uh, New Haven Legal Assistance, we represent individuals who can't afford a lawyer. Um, and we do a variety of different kinds of work. Uh, we represent students who are facing a loss of their education. Uh, we represent women who are victims of domestic violence, uh, people who are in jeopardy of losing their benefits, undocumented immigrants who are being deported. But year in and year out, the number one issue that clients come to us with are housing matters. Um, and there are a number of reasons for that. Um, but uh, the primary reason really is twofold. Um, the lack uh, and, and little existence of affordable housing, but also the mo most number of people we represent are women, mostly women of color who are low wage workers who cannot afford uh, rent and cannot afford market rent. Um, and so I say that to give you a little bit of a context because we have been seeing a housing crisis for many years and the pandemic has only highlighted that and raised awareness of that. Um, approximately 20,000 evictions are filed each year against tenants in, in Connecticut. And we have four cities that rank in the top 100 in terms of evictions being filed in the country, which is pretty astounding considering that we're such a small state. Um, another issue that we see regularly is a, a, really a power imbalance between tenants and landlords. Uh, most landlords are represented by attorneys. Approximately 90% of landlords uh, who are filing evictions against tenants are represented, whereas just about 10% of tenants are represented. And there really is a disproportionality in terms of women of color being uh, evicted um, versus white women. And many people have actually analogized the impact of evictions on women of color to the impact of mass incarceration on black men in terms of what that means for the future of, of those families. Many of the clients that we represent are women who are raising families or raising small children. And so again, we see this kind of consistency of criminalizing and um, blaming people who are living uh, in poverty. While the eviction moratorium, which was implemented a number of months ago, um, has provided some relief to individuals, um, it's not a fix. Um, and it's not a fix because most of the people who are being evicted are being evicted for non-payment of rent. Um, and so if we don't have real robust rent relief or rental assistance programs, uh, these families are just going to face um, a crisis going forward once the moratoriums are ended. And so finding ways that we can um, give rental assistance and provide rent relief to a lot of these families uh, is really, really critical. Um, what we've seen uh, over the last uh, few months is clients who are coming to us who have had evictions filed on them before the pandemic so before the eviction moratorium began. And the pandemic only made things worse for those families. So these were families who were already in crisis uh, because of limited income, because of um, other issues that people living in, in poverty face. And the pandemic only made things worse for them because either they were themselves suffering from illness or had to take care of family members who were ill or because they had job loss, which they have not been able to find new jobs or they have their hours reduced. And so now people who may have been two or three months behind in rent back in January or February of 2020 are now finding themselves months and months behind. And so finding ways to provide relief to those families is really critical. And so one thing that I would um, wanna highlight is there have been a number of cities around the country that have looked at what's called a right to counsel. And so essentially it is modeled after the public defender system on the criminal justice side where people who can't afford a lawyer are provided one 
in the civil context in housing. And it has been uh, successful in many places, uh, partly because it's been a, a grassroots movement uh, in many cities where community members, um, landlords included, and other folks have gotten together and said, this is a community issue. Um, housing is, a, is an issue that affects us all. Uh, economically, it affects us all, um, but also in other ways, right? Um, when we think about Connecticut and other states in our region, um, we, want to, we should be concerned about evicting people and having people homeless in the middle of a pandemic, but also in the middle of the winter. I mean, we're looking tomorrow at incredibly cold numbers. Um, and so how do we want our families to be able to navigate that? Um, and so right to counsel would provide lawyers for tenants who, who need them um, and kind of eliminate or try to eliminate that power imbalance that exists so often uh, in, in housing court. Um, so that's kind of what we've been seeing over the last uh, several months. Um, we anticipate, um, you know, once the moratorium is over to continue to see uh, increased numbers of folks coming to us who have evictions. Um, and we're really concerned about, again, um, you know, the winter families, um, you know, we're also in a, in a moment now where families with children are in a very critical situation with a lot of children learning from home. And so the impact that, you know, evictions and, and um, being homeless has on, on that, that dynamic um, and also the stress that that has placed on many women uh, of, of color who are trying to navigate balancing work with learning at home for their children. Um, and so that's a, a major concern for us as well. So thank you again for your, your time. Um, if there are any questions later, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you so much, Alexis, for sharing your work and the work of your colleagues with us. Um, in addition to providers and advocates sharing the work they are doing and the impact of the pandemic they are seeing among their clients, we also wanted to share the experiences of women living through the pandemic. As I said earlier, for the first time in Connecticut's history, women have outpaced men in unemployment claims. And, uh, oops, sorry. And 75% of the women applying for unemployment who indicated their education level did not have a college degree. Women are 49% of Connecticut's workforce. And what we wanna ask is how can we build opportunities for education and job training to protect them against the kind of economic impact we're seeing with COVID-19? The YW Career Women Program of the YWCA Hartford Region offers a model that works. I'd like to introduce you to a student in that program, Alicia Yard, who will share with you her personal experience of weathering COVID-19. And I'm very pleased to welcome Alicia. Um, Hi, can you hear hey. me? Yeah, good morning. <laughs> Good morning. I'm not sure if you can see me. Oh, here I am. I can see you look great. <laughs> okay. Hi. Thank you for introducing me and thank you for having me. Um, my name is great. Alicia and uh, I'm a current resident of Hartford. Um, I'm also a single mom and I'm currently pursu uh, pursuing my degree in nursing so that I can improve my environment and also um, my financial situation for me and my daughter. Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, how the pandemic has made it more difficult for you to go to work and to school? Um, yeah, so I, it, it's been very difficult. Um, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank. So that's okay. I, at a local hospital um, as a nurse's aide in various departments. And I also work at a parole office. Um, doing COVID screening, uh, screenings. And when the pandemic first hit, I lost my job um, 
due to having to homeschool, which I know a lot of moms are going through having to homeschool my eight-year-old daughter through the second grade and also homeschooling myself at the same time. Um, at the time, I only had one computer, so it was really tough. My daughter's school provided that computer for um, her to learn. So it was like her taking a break, me going on, her going on. It was, it was pure chaos. Um, and then because of my lack of employment, I struggled keeping Wi-Fi on in my home. And thankfully, they had so many pandemic relief programs um, through the billing system. So I was able to um, like join and it saved our education and also my sanity at the time. <laughs> um, the uh, pandemic affected um, my employment mostly because I had no one to watch my daughter while I went to work. So I lost my job because I wasn't able to pick up hours. Um, and it's it just was really tough. And at the time, I was afraid of going out in such great time of uncertainty. I'm a nurse's aide. So working like frontline, um, helping nurses and doctors within the healthcare field, um, it was um, very very difficult, um, just scared. You know, there was no vaccine at the time, no cure. Thousands were dying fast. Um, life was so vastly changed. Working through the pandemic um, now is even more difficult. You're having to stay in your N95 mask for eight plus hours. Um, and sometimes without a break, uh, making sure you're putting on your PPE correctly, and most importantly, taking off your PPE correctly so that you don't like contract COVID and take it home to your family. Um, so even with doing um, COVID screenings, um, it's, you know, multiple staff have tested positive, you know, throughout this time, and I come in contact with them. So it's, it's very, very um, scary. It's just a scary time. So yeah. It's been difficult working through the pandemic. Um, so Alicia, can you tell me a little bit about the YW Career Women Program and how it has been helpful or supportive to you? Yeah, absolutely. So the YW Career Women's Program has helped me tremendously um, from helping me allocate uh, fundamental resources for my education um, to helping me with stipends for housing while I attend school. Um, to networking with other students um, within the program and like bouncing ideas off of each other um, in that way. Um, that's helpful as well. Like I feel without this program, I'd be completely lost. Um, the guidance that it has provided um, for me being a young single mother and a student is unmatched. Um, I feel like sometimes when you're a student, you just feel stuck or unmotivated and don't know where to turn or what your next step should be, should be, excuse me. And the YW Career Women's helps to provide clarity in those difficult moments. Um, I think it's a safe space to share struggles and to get the help that you need without being judged um, or treated unfairly and your struggles aren't being amplified or shared with the community. Um, and that's what makes the program really great. Um, so what is your, what's your future plan? What is your goal? What is YW Career Women helping you reach toward? Um, I plan on being either emergency department nurse or a intensive care unit nurse. Um, I think what this pandemic has taught for, uh, taught everyone is to be um, uh, prepared in emergent situations. People have had to become emergency uh, uh, department nurses and intensive care nurses within their own homes caring for their sick families. So I think um, the YW Careers Women is just helping me to navigate through the program through the very stressful times and just motivating me to continue on um, to finish what I started. So we've got some legislators and policymakers on this call. What do you want to tell them about the help that you need that other women in your situation need? I feel um, if I had anything to tell legislators, um, it would be to make college free for uh, struggling minority students, um, because oftentimes that's a barrier in continuing education and also more funding programs through hard financial times, um, like rental assistance, maybe food, more food uh, programs, more rental assistance, more rental assistance programs. I know there is some out there. 
um, and perhaps also a safe housing community for students and single mothers that maybe is income based because the environment in which you reside in um, directly affects your ability um, as a student, you know, to maintain academic integrity while worrying about, you know, how you're going to keep a roof over your head is very difficult. Um, and I feel like if legislators could increase housing voucher programs and provide safe, affordable, quality housing, um, I believe that passing rates in school would increase and um, homelessness and mental health crises uh, would decrease. Man, you did such a good job. Thank you so much for being here this okay. morning. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Um, and extra thanks to Alicia. She is like ducking in and out of work, got permission yeah. from her supervisor to be here today. So um, I think it's amazing that you stood up for your community um, to represent them. And, and um, you're speaking for so many women. So thank you so much. Thank you. So, so thank much. you for having me. All right. Bye. <laughs> um. So we can't thank Alicia enough for being with us this morning. Um, and now we're gonna turn to our last speaker. Um, integral to the findings around employment are those around childcare. We believe that childcare is critical to the future of our country and its success, as well as an essential workforce necessity of the modern economy. The data tells us that childcare slots in Connecticut are in severe danger with over 46,000 expected to be lost. To be sure, Connecticut did not have an oversupply of childcare providers and slots to begin with. Overlay the loss of those 46,000 slots with the report findings that 92% of childcare providers are women-owned businesses, and the majority of those women of color-owned businesses. The current landscape presents a double whammy for employees and business owners. Our next speaker, Candace Dorman, is the CEO and founder of Emlyn Group Productions, a digital marketing company that provides marketing and video solutions for creative entrepreneurs. But Candace is also formerly a, fi a family child care provider. She closed her program in 2020 and has stayed involved in the child care industry by using her podcast, Amplify, to lift the voices of child care educators. A Bronx native, she currently lives in New Haven with her husband's and husband and two young sons. Thank you so much, Candace, for being here this morning. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Good morning to everyone who's on the call. Uh, thank you, Jenny and the Aurora Foundation for including me in this this important conversation. And thank you to any elected officials and community members who have made time to be here this morning. Uh, as Jenny said, my name is Candace Dorman and I'm here as a business owner. I'm a mom, a wife to two young sons. I'm a Connecticut resident for the last 12 years. And while I'm a New Yorker at, for life, I'm a New Yorker for life, there's something sticky and spongy about Connecticut. And I find myself immersed and connect, connected to this place. So I've made it my home. I'm here today, as, a, as I said, as a professional and a business owner. Until the COVID-19 pandemic, I owned a home-based family childcare business for three years. For during that time, I built a successful business, completely transforming my home into a haven for community children focused on outdoor and nature play. My clients became a part of my extended family and children like cousins to my sons. I spent a full year preparing to open under the official state process. I connected a I connected with a local organization, All Our Kin, to enhance my working knowledge of business management and to supplement my parenting skills with practical early childhood education knowledge because I'm not formally uh, a formal teacher. All of that effort came to a screeching halt in March 2020. The very real fear of the coronavirus affecting my young son with asthma was enough to make me bolt my doors and hide. Sometimes I'm ashamed that I didn't push through or that I could not make it work. It feels like failure, but failure is a far easier pill to swallow than the fear of losing my child. When we talk about the effects of COVID-19 and the pandemic, when we talk about their effects on women and children and girls, we are not talking about numbers, data, or inconvenience. We are talking about life. 
women across the state and country have had to make impossible decisions between their livelihood and their lives. Just three weeks into the pandemic, one of my clients had three members of her family contract the virus. If I was unsure of my decision, that confirmed that I had made the, the, the right one. But at what cost? Women make up the vast majority of childcare providers and typically have families of their own. On top of that, home-based programs are exactly that. They are in your home. And what happens when the job you need to take care of your family is the exact thing that could harm your family? There has been a lot of talk of the importance of childcare and that childcare workers are essential employees, but we are not talking about employees. We must elevate and humanize the women who break their backs to carry this country at every step. Women and girls are suffering under the immense pressure of the pandemic and what happens in homes behind shut doors. Black women and girls are in danger and are often left unseen. As a country, we make it very clear what our priorities are. You only need to follow the money to see. The American bravado has us looking outward and interfering where we have no business casting stones. Our women can dress how they want, but can we go to the doctor? Can we get sick time so that we don't have to decide between our health and our bills? A country is nothing without their people and people must be, feel safe to function in our society. A strong and purposeful infrastructure that actively funds and enhances the education system at every level, starting with early childhood education, is imperative to our survival and our overall recovery. Our economic recovery is nothing without a thriving female population. There are so many women who could be on this call who are still operating their childcare businesses in the midst of fear and actual danger. Women whose entire working lives have been in childcare and without it feel a sense of loss and a sense, a loss of self that can't even be adequately described. It should not take a group of women spending money to collect data that says things we already know to convince people to do things that must be done. At every turn, focus on women, look to women and listen to women. It's honestly the best bang for your buck. And it's really that simple. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Candace. That was, I, the chat says Candace for president. Um, <laughs> Thank you. You'll stick around for <laughs> questions. Um, that, that was amazing. I'm so moved by you. But um, for our call to action, I'm excited to welcome um, Trisha Hyacinth, the Senior Director of the uh, Fund for Women and Girls from the Fairfield, Fairfield County's uh, Community Foundation. Thanks, Jenny. I know it is a mouthful. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Candice, uh, for sharing your experiences and your perspectives on childcare. And I agree with you. We have to look to women and listen uh, to women. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Trisha Hyacinth, and as Jenny said, I am the Senior Director for uh, the Fund for Women and Girls at Fairfield County's Community Foundation. We are really proud to partner with Aurora and other women and girls funds on the creation of essential equity. We hope this conversation has inspired you to take action. There are three actions we'd like you to take the first is to visit the newly updated Women and Girls data platform for more data. The second action is to read and share the report with decision makers across sectors. And finally, we'd love for you to consider supporting your local women's fund. There are 12 in Connecticut and collectively we are making seismic waves in the lives of women and girls through our research funding and advocacy. At this time, we'd like to open the floor for questions. So please feel free to put your questions in the chat. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tricia. And I think, um, I think Marie, we have one more slide that highlights the women and girls data platform that we can, so folks can see. Um, for those who aren't familiar with it, 
Um, I love to get super uh, nerdy about <laughs> the, this amazing online interactive, um, really 21st century tool. Um, you can look up, uh, it's organized by various categories and then you can um, actually see the data um, visualizations change as you change the geography that you're looking at. So you can compare areas across the state and then uh, major cities and all of the counties in uh, Connecticut. So um, th this was an exciting thing to launch in 2019. And so we're excited to develop it and keep going um, by updating it in 2020, as well as adding the COVID research. So thanks so much. So we're starting to get questions. So the first one from um, Kathleen, what are the most important issues uh, to support that are being considered in Hartford this session? Um, that is a great question. Um, we, we don't know exactly what is coming up before the legislature. Um, right now, there are some, um, some things that we know about that are in the report, like even simple things like making um, uh, uh, the Connecticut um, uh, Coalition Against Domestic Violence worked to have uh, restraining orders not require in-person uh, notary. You didn't have to go physically in person to a notary to get a restraining order. So they're looking to extend that and to make that um, a longer term uh, solution. So there are some very small and practical things like that. Um, does anyone else on the panel have uh, other answers for that? Jenny, it looks like Finn put in that in terms of housing, we need meaningful rental assistance and more vouchers. I don't know if Finn wants to talk about that. Thank you so much, Michelle. Hi, this is Finn Darby Hedgens with the Connecticut Fair Housing Center. Um, and we're actually closely collecting the eviction data um, and, and we have been since 2017. So we're really sort of keyed into what's going on. But as far as this legislative session in terms of housing and what we're understanding to be the needs are, we need meaningful rental assistance and not necessarily for rental or rearage, but for rental payments going forward. If we're truly going to stop the spread of COVID-19, people need to be stable in their homes and paying rental arrearages doesn't necessarily do that, right? Because it doesn't stop the rent from being due the following month. The other thing is we need eviction moratorias to match the length of the public health care crisis. Um, so currently we're asking our legislature to legislate both of those items. In addition, we are also asking for an increase in housing subsidies. Um, some additional questions that we're seeing um, are uh, around childcare and investments um, in childcare that should be prioritized. Um, does anyone want to answer to those questions? I mean, some of the practical things are to expand care for kids, to uh, apply uh, to subsidies for childcare to people that are in job training programs or that who are unemployed and looking for work, that that would be um, one way to expand the existing system, I think is, you know, probably the most low hanging fruit. Jenny, we talked about making sure that there are support systems for biz, for childcare business owners to help them navigate the process of applying for some of these programs, the PP, um, PPP loan, like all, all the acronyms, right? Um, sometimes there is an absolute barrier to access, um, whether you whether that's Wi-Fi, as simple as Wi-Fi, or as complicated as really not being able to um, to read the application, right? Is it available in all the languages that are available? that are necessary? Are there translators? Are there support systems? I just feel like there are too many barriers to entry and we should be making it very easy for people to get the support that they need for their businesses and then you know, come around at the back end and, and fix things then, right? Um, but don't make it so hard for, um, don't make it so hard for people who are operating solopreneurs by themselves um, when larger businesses or you know more established businesses have whole teams or lawyers or accountants or whoever who can help them apply for these um, these subsidies. Um, 
great. And I and Sharif Phoenix Sharp is also in the chat saying that the Council on Women and Girls, uh, the Governor's Council on Women and Girls, is endorsing um, two childcare bills in the coming session. Um, and then we're getting some more questions about um, further research. So it is definitely, um, I don't know, my personal goal and uh, Michelle Rudinold, who's my kind of partner in crime producing this research, it is our goal that we'll follow this up, that we'll, um, we'll uh, figure out some funding to look at, right? We looked at the first six months of the pandemic, but can we come back and uh, you know, revisit this data in a year? Um, there was also a question in here about um, the, the methodology and how we produced the report. Somebody missed the kind of early session. Um, we did, M Michelle, maybe you want to take this, but we did partner with Connecticut Data Collaborative to actually um, get the data for us. It is all publicly available data, although we did work with some, um, certainly some uh, nonprofit data as well. No. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure, Jenny. I'll yeah. Um, yeah, so we, we looked at um, publicly available data that was really collected in real time that was um, um, critical for this. So we looked at some state, agenc state agencies um, and then there was a federal product called the um, Household Poll Survey, which collected, did surveys across the country weekly to assess um, um, how people were faring during the pandemic on topics such as housing, food stability, employment, um, educational disruptions, um, mental health, childcare, and I'm sure I'm missing other um, topics. But so a lot of the information in our report um, comes from that survey. We also reached out, um, as Jenny said, to um, Connecticut Fair Housing Center for data on evictions. Um, we reached out to um, uh, 211, United Way 211 for data on calls um, for assistance and um, so those were the primary sources and happy to answer any more specific questions if you have any. Um, and there was also a, a you know, a follow up question to, you know, the, the question about more data, more reports. We do have a whole section in the report about uh, deeper dives we'd like to do. Um, in the chat, someone is asking particularly about girls of color. Um, so that is definitely an area we would love to uh, pursue in more depth. Um, it's difficult to get at that data, which maybe Michelle can talk about why it's so hard, but it definitely is not as easy yeah, as it should be. Right. I, you know, a lot of times too, we you deal with privacy concerns, right? Particularly with children, we want to protect their privacy. Um, and so um, getting data disaggregated um, by gender, race and ethnicity um, for children um, can often um, be challenging. And just, I mean, we, we tried to um, look as, at much, as much as we could, but given the time frame, we couldn't look at the, the entire lifespan, which is something that we included in um, the report. Sometimes the data just are not available. For example, we didn't have um, COVID data by broken down by gender and then um, by race and ethnicity and by age. So, um, you know, when you talk about getting it disaggregated multiple levels, it is, um, it's not always available publicly, but that would be something we could pursue for further research. Um, and we've got a question about how um, the Women and Girls Funds in the state are going to be using this data um, and looking at how to act on it. Um, uh, Definitely the women's funds across the state are looking to um, better collect um, their data on kind of how they are serving the community. So I feel like we will definitely be able to, um, to think about a way to, uh, to share that going forward. For sure. Carolyn Hoffman asks, how can we support Women and Girls Funds uh, to forward this research and do more? Um, you, can act you can help us spread the word about this data um, on Aurora's website, auroraFoundation.org. You'll find, um, we have a page on the report and there is a link where you can send the report to your legislator. 
Um, it's a whole, um, it's an easy online thing where it, you'll put in your address and it'll identify your legislators and then it gives you a message about the report that you can send out. That's a way to really spread the word um, and get it out there. Um, and then uh, you'll see in the report connections to each of the funds that uh, help fund this report. Um, you can go directly and make donations on their websites. Um, that's a way and let, let them know that what you want is more research like this. Anybody else have suggestions from the other funders in the room? Melinda Johnson is offering us to look at the YWCA Hartford Region's advocacy agenda. She's put it in the chat. So that's another great place to look at. Um, Ray's putting more resources here. Um, the, uh, Sharif and Sharp also lets us know that the Council on Women and Girls is supporting a bill to expand UPASS in an effort to assist with some of the transportation barriers that were mentioned. So UPASS um, helps students uh, get transportation uh, for free. So that's certainly about a barrier that Aurora has seen in our work with um, getting more women access to higher education. Um, and then, uh, let's see. Can the resources be sent via uh, email too? Um, Sandra's asking, um, and Marie is, of course, already on it, saying she's going to send out an email to everyone on this uh, on the call um, with uh, links to all the resources that we've talked about today. Ooh. Let's see. Um, Quelf on here has also shared their 2021 legislative agenda. They put that in the chat, so we'll be sure to also include that in the email that goes out. Um, and the Women in Leadership Center of the University of St. Joseph is looking to uh, also do some more um, research around uh, the aftermath to women of COVID. So we'll also be, um, and they're doing that by survey and we'll include an, a link to that for people to participate. Um, and Candace asks about whether the state could possibly fund free Wi-Fi. I think that's an interesting um, and important question. Um, and uh, Tanisha Grant was able to answer that the city of Hartford is offering free remote learning hubs to moderate and low income families. Um, let's see, anyone else have other, would anybody else like to comment or offer a question? Any of our speakers or funders? Hi, Jennifer. I'm happy to add a little bit of comments to some of the things I'm seeing in the chat. So um, Alexis Smith was answering Liza about rental supports. And one of the things that I think it's really interesting when people are discussing um, where and how to use this money is that there is no pot of money large enough to pay what we're estimating the arrearages to be, which we believe are around $500 million at this point. So even the combination of state and federal isn't going to cover arrears, right? So there's just, so, so our plans need to be supporting families moving forward, right? That has to be how we recover economically and how we recover caregivers, right? So that they can secure their housing. So just to give people a scope of what meaningful rental assistance looks like, it has to be coverage for the future. 
if I could just add one point to that, one movement that has, has happened um, around the country, including um, here in Connecticut, is the movement around cancel rent, which would uh, forgive essentially a lot of families arrearages, which as Finn pointed out, are pretty extensive. Um, the New Haven Housing Authority did that for the month of July, I believe, for families, um, just to kind of give people some, some degree of relief. But the numbers are astounding. So we do need to kind of think about how we reimagine in a big way, providing some relief uh, to families. Um, absolutely. And I think um, Alexis and Finn would both talk about, you know, what's going to happen to families that fall into home, they don't fall, right? They're pushed into homelessness by this crisis, right? That, that coming back from that, um, is devastating, right? And, and extremely expensive. So that's gonna cause a whole um, kind of, yeah, the crisis won't just end with their eviction. Um, I wanna be sure and point out that, um, you know, we are excited about so many data projects that are focused on women. Um, we focused on publicly available data, but the PCSW, um, you'll see in the chat, they are um, they have done an extensive survey project um, that we're looking forward to seeing uh, how those results complement uh, this work. So uh, we'll share that they're closing that survey soon on January 31st. So we would encourage you all to go and participate in that survey. We'll include that in the email that goes out after this. Um, I missed an earlier question about how we are working with BIPOC and uh, BIPOC uh, uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color organizations around this report. Um, our primary audience when we were conceiving this report was the Connecticut Collective for Women and Girls, which includes many BIPOC uh, women and girls serving organizations. Um, they have, we have about 50 member organizations right now, a statewide network of organizations that are serving women and girls. So we'll also put a link to that if you have an organization that would like uh, to consider joining us um, there's no membership fee, but we do a lot of great networking, professional development, and um, we have legislative update calls that are led by Quelf that we're looking forward to in the coming weeks. Um, let's see. Um, great. Are there any questions that I missed? Feel free to unmute yourselves and just chime up because the chat's kind of fast and furious. Jenny, it's Candace. I just wanted to say thank you again to the Aurora Foundation and to all of the membership organizations. I think it's so um, it's so easy to shy away from putting to shining a lens, like shining a light and focusing on a you know acute section of our population, right? And to to say that it's important for us to focus on women and girls, right? I have two sons, but I absolutely recognize that a rising tide lifts all boats, right? So if we can fix this problem that that is affecting women, we know that helping women helps families, helps communities, helps the world, right? So um, just kudos and thank you again to you guys and to the Aurora Foundation and to all of the membership organizations that are really saying it's important to be specific. Um, thanks so much, Candace. I do not want to forget that this was a, a collaborative effort that I'm just a uh, the MC for today, but um, <laughs> thanks so much. I uh, really, and that's what I think is so important about this is that we did make it a statewide effort that we made sure to pull in um, uh, organizations um, from around the state that all the women's funds were stepping up to participate and to, and um, right, I think to call for data that we could, you know, this is just the first step, right? The next step is kind of formulating the policies and, and the solutions. But we knew that this, dead, this data was like the bedrock to start on, that we, we needed to kind of back up our, our um, the feeling that we had, our, uh, the kind of broken heart that we had knowing what was gonna, you know, we knew what was gonna come and to be able to um, figure out a way to prove that, to demonstrate to the people that have the power and uh, the resources. Um, and to really show them that 
that while we named the report essential equity, right? Equity is such a focus. Justice is such a focus of this report that it that good solutions are not gonna come unless we focus on women and girls. The solutions will only be partial. They'll be less effective. Um, so really the way for Connecticut to go forward is to center women and girls. So that's our, that's our big message. Um, so I don't know, are there any other questions? I, am, I can't tell you how excited I am to have so many folks join us for this call. Um, right, this has been a lot of work. We, I couldn't have done it without our funding partners, without uh, Connecticut Data Collaborative. Um, so this is really gratifying to see the response to the months that we have put into this. So it's, um, it's just the start, right? We'll be, we'll be um, doing more, uh, look for, we're excited to partner with CT Data coming up to do a, um, a data literacy training, right? So for women and girls serving organizations that want to learn how to use this data for grant making, for uh, donor appeals, um, to make their programs better. Uh, uh, CT Data does fabulous educational work. And so we've commissioned them to design one around um, the women and girls data platform so that everyone, so that everybody can use it to get more resources to women and girls. So look for that coming up as well. And we're excited we're gonna present to the Women's Caucus of the Connecticut Legislature next week. So hopefully we, more solutions will come out of that as well. Great. Any other questions? I kind of hate to go. You all look, so, it's so fun to see you all. <laughs> Great job. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks so much, Candace. You were awesome. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Talk later, Jenny. Oh, yeah. I'm sure we will. <laughs> Thanks so much for having Thank me. Thank you, Candace. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> I've got faces everywhere. Thank you so much, Michelle. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you for your participation and contribution. It was great. And good luck. To Thank you. you. <laughs> Hopefully you get the supports. Thank you. Where are the buttons? <laughs> There's like so many windows open. I can't find the goodbye button. There it is. All right. Have a good day. I got to run. Bye. Bye.